Hello, we apologize for the delay. Let's get started. We're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Epigenetics in Human Health and Disease. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Zymo Research. Zymo Research Corporation has been providing the scientific community with comprehensive nucleic acid solutions for DNA and RNA research and epigenetics for more than two decades. Since 1994, it has been serving the academia and biopharma scientific communities by providing DNA and RNA purification products. The company's unique achievements include development of the first available micro elution spin column technology for nucleic acid purification. And in 2000, Zymo was among the first companies to offer products for epigenetics based research. In 2011, the company launched its genetic and epigenetic services with state-of-the-art next-gen sequencing and bioinformatics technologies. To date, Zymo maintains the most comprehensive offering of services for genetic, epigenetic, and transcriptome analysis. To learn more, visit www.zymoresearch.com. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. You can pose questions to the speakers during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them in the Q&A box, which will open when you click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at lower left. I now present today's speakers, Peter Jones, PhD, Research Director and Chief Scientific Officer at the Van Andel Research Institute, and Nandor Tan, MD, PhD, Director of Systems Biology of Reproduction Laboratory at the Research Center for Natural Sciences and Senior Research Fellow at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Dr. Jones joined the University of Southern California in 1977 and served as director of the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center between 1993 and 2011. His laboratory discovered the effects of 5-azacytidine on cytosine methylation, and he first established the link between DNA methylation, gene expression, and differentiation. He pioneered the field of epigenetics, particularly its role in cancer, and helped develop novel therapies for cancer. Dr. Jones is a past president of the American Association for Cancer Research and was elected as a fellow of the Academy of the AACR in 2013. He has published more than 300 scientific papers and received several honors, including the Outstanding Investigator Grant from the National Cancer Institute. He and his colleague, Dr. Stephen Balin, shared the Kirk A. Landon Award for Basic Cancer Research from the AACR in 2009 and Medal of Honor from the American Cancer Society in 2011. Dr. Tan also holds appointments at the First Department of Pathology and Experimental Cancer Research and Maternity Clinic, Semmelweis University in Budapest, and at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at USC. His work focuses on placental development and disease pathways of pregnancy complications using tools of high dimensional and systems biology. His pivotal findings include the molecular characterization of placental proteins, including the determination of 91 sequences in 15 species and their study as biomarkers, the discovery of placenta specific lectin family important in regulating maternal fetal immune interactions in primates and the systems biological characterization of disturbed placental gene networks in preeclampsia, including a newly defined pathway of deep trophoblast invasion in humans. Dr. Tan's multidisciplinary research is rooted in his experience in distinct fields. To view both speakers' complete files, visit the LabRoots website. Dr. Jones will now begin his presentation titled The Cancer Epigenome. Thank you for allowing me to present this seminar. I'm going to be talking about the cancer epigenome, but I will be mainly focusing on the role of DNA methylation in controlling the structure and output of the epigenome, and also will then end my talk with the uh, question of how can we use epigenetic therapies to improve the outcome of patients with cancer. 
So first of all, I'd like to start with a slide, a histology slide, to remind you that the name chromatin is a term which was developed more than 100 years ago to describe the fact that the material within the nucleus of the cell actually stained um, uh, differently from the cytoplasm. And it was called chromatin because it attracts color in the Greek word chrome, uh, uh, chroma. And so what people discovered very rapidly afterwards was that if they looked at microscope slides of cancer tissues, for example, in a slide of human skin, that the cancerous uh, uh, outgrowth on the left-hand side of the slide as you look at it, that the chromatin in cancer cells was different. And in fact, this altered chromatin is actually a major uh, diagnostic uh, criterion which pathologists use to uh, characterize cancer. So a diagnosis of cancer is often made on, the, um, uh, on, on, on what the chromatin looks like. So we're only now just beginning to understand why this might be and the relationship between uh, DNA methylation and chromatin is what we'll be focusing on today. Now chromatin is rather an amorphous material that as I'm sure you all know is actually made up of a beautiful subunit which is called the nucleosome which consists of about 146 base pairs of DNA round, wrapped around a, uh, an octamer of, of histones. If you look at the, at the bottom left of the slide you can see this beautiful beads and the string structure. And over the last 30 or 40 years, we're finally beginning to actually figure out uh, at a final level how the uh, chromatin is altered uh, with respect to the nucleosome and how this gives functionality to, um, to chromatin. So the questions we can now begin to answer is how are the histones marked? They have these um, post-translational modification. What histone variants are there and what do they do with respect to um, the function of, of chromatin? Where is the DNA methylated? How are the nucleosomes phased and how do they communicate? And so finally, we're beginning to be able to answer these questions and figure out how chromatin operates in normal cells and how it is altered during the process of uh, transformation. So the next picture is a structure uh, shown in a diagram diagrammatic form to show the DNA wrapped around nucleosomes. Uh, with the main point being made that most of the regulation of chromatin occurs in nucleosome depleted regions, which actually allow regulatory factors such as transcription factors and enhance the binding proteins, etc to recognize the DNA sequence, which is actually concealed while it is wrapped around uh, nucleosomes. One of the things that has come out from the, um, the work of the, you know, the cancer genome atlas and other projects is the realization, uh, which I might point out was completely unexpected, that many of the genes that modify chromatin are actually mutated in human cancers. And so this shows you in this slide some of these kinds of uh, mutations which have been discovered. But some of them are missing actually because many of the mutations also occur in proteins which actually shift the nucleosomes around and allow the chromatin to either open or close to allow different functionalities to occur. So what we've learned over the last five years is that many cancer-causing mutations occur in genes which modify chromatin. And I think this justifies the fact that altered chromatin can be seen under the microscope and is uh, therefore probably a really uh, valid tool uh, as we begin to understand how things have gone wrong, but much more importantly, to figure out how we might be able to design uh, drugs, for example, which can target chromatin and restore a more normal function uh, to the cell. Now finding open areas therefore, in other words where most of the regulation occurs, is a major challenge and of great importance in figuring out the uh, regulatory pathways which exist. 
Now, mostly the way one does this is to use uh, enzymes such as DNAs1 or micropropyl nuclease, which actually can cut DNA as shown by the scissors in open areas, but actually uh, block cutting uh, when the uh, DNA is wrapped around the nucleosome. So one can actually therefore use nuclei from cells, treat with uh, DNAs1, or micropropyl nuclears and find out where the open regions are. So you can figure out how the changes occur during transcriptional activation, for example, or what's the structure of enhances, for example. Now in my group, we've actually decided to, to adopt a different strategy to find these open areas, because what we're actually interested in is not just where the open areas are, but how do they relate to where the DNA is methylated, for example. And to do this, we use a methyl transferase, which is um, encoded by a, um, a virus that infects uh, algae, which actually has the ability to apply methyl groups to cytosine residues, which are downstream of a guan. So in the slide, if you look at these uh, green horseshoes, that's the methyl transferase. So it puts a methyl group on a cytosine downstream of a guan. Whereas, uh, which is not normally methylated in, in, in human cells, uh, in which most of the methylation occurs at a C, which is upstream of a guan. And so if we treat nuclei with this enzyme, we can see not only where uh, there are open areas, but we can also look after sodium bisulfide sequencing where the actual endogenous DNA methylation occurred. So firstly, let me show you a head-to-head -head comparison of these two methods. We call it NOM-seq for nucleosome occupancy and, and methylation sequencing. And this is uh, results from a colon cancer cell line showing you the results, the DNA is one where red shows you the open areas. The C1, C2, C3, 4, uh, 4 are actually just clusters uh, which are being bioinformatically positioned next to the, uh, with relationship to the nucleosome depleted region center. And so you can see these open regions, but if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the beautiful uh, uh, additional information you can see using NOMC, where the deep green is the nucleosome depleted region, but then there are these amazing uh, uh, sequences where you can see phasing of the nucleosomes very clearly, where green shows accessible and white shows inaccessible, and you can clearly see where the DNA um, uh, is open and also how the uh, nucleosomes are phased. So let's discuss, first of all, the structure of insulators. I don't have, you, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, insulators are often bound by the factor CTCF. And we can use our approach then to see how the uh, nucleosomes are, um, um, sorry, are uh, located in this region. So using uh, uh, sodium bisulfite sequencing of individual molecules following treatment with the enzyme, you can see here that in the, um, uh, at a particular CTCF binding site, there is no endogenous DNA methylation as indicated by the open white circles with some sporadic methylation shown with the black dots. And then if you look down below the result with the known seq where you can clearly see a region protected exactly where the CTCF factor binds and green teal areas to the, uh, on either side which indicate where the DNA can be uh, uh, methylated by this GC enzyme. And without going into any great detail, if we look at this uh, 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 cartoon, we can see that we, where the CTCF sites are occupied, as shown by the anchor, the, um, the, um, uh, the DNA is inaccessible, and that most of the methylation which occurs, the endogenous methylation, although this wasn't shown in the slide I just showed you, is actually between the nucleosomes. And so at CTCF sites, it's the only uh, part in the, uh, uh, that we see this um, methylation outside of the nucleosomal uh, core particles. Let's then discuss the structure of um, uh, transcription start sites. And I'm going to focus my attention here on CPG island transcription start sites, which are present at about 60% uh, of human genes. 
Now remember that, uh, that, that these regions are very CG rich, while the rest of the, um, uh, the genome is actually CPG depleted. To try and figure out exactly what DNA methylation does with transcription start sites, we've used a cell line derived by Bert Vogelstein and Steve Balin and Andy Feinberg in which 95% of the methylation is removed by genetic knockout. And then by comparing the gnome C appearance of these two cell types, we can see what a particular region looks like when it's methylated and when it's lost its methylation. So the next slide shows you uh, the kind of thing that we can see. So this shows you on the left-hand side the HCT116 cells, and the blue on the left-hand side means unmethylated, and in the DKO, that is the cell line which is missing DNA methylation. If you look at the bottom of the slide, there are 3,216 sites which are now yellow in the, in the HCT116 cells, in which DNA methylation is strong in this region of the transcription start site. And this methylation has been lost in the DKO cells because the enzymes have been uh, crippled by removal and uh, using genetic knockout. Now, if you look at the right-hand side of the slide, you can see what happens with respect to the accessibility um, of these regions following loss of methylation. So first of all, you can see on the, uh, the ACT116 and the DKO cells, if you look at the green areas, you see not only the beautiful large areas which are accessible, again showed by this green teal appearance, but you can also see the, um, the phasing of the nucleosomes on either side of this region. This has never been seen before uh, in mammalian cells, although it has been seen uh, in yeast. Now, in, with the, in the red box, you see what happens uh, to those regions which were methylated in the cancer cells, and you can see what happens when the methylation is removed by the genetic knockout that we have discussed uh, just a while earlier on. Now, if we look at this in a bit more detail by blowing up the region, looking just at the regions uh, which were yellow, i.e. completely methylated in the wild-type cells, and then look at what's happening in the uh, DKO cells in which the methylation is lost, we can see that in many regions we actually gain um, accessibility following the loss of uh, DNA methylation. And by coupling our approach together with um, ChIP-seq, in which we look at the histone modifications, we can actually see that there are two regions uh, at the top, regions which do not display a nucleosome depleted region at the transcription start site, and those at the bottom which do. And interestingly, the ones at the top, which have lost DNA methylation, have gained another silencing mark, the polycomb repressive mark, which is shown in red for histone 3, H3, K27 trimethylation, in which the DNA methylation mark has been switched for a, um, um, for a, for a histone modification which keeps the genes silent and actually uh, repressed. So if we look uh, in this, uh, the next slide, which I've skipped one, you can see that, in fact, we can now figure out what happens and what the role of DNA methylation is um, at these uh, uh, CPG islands, which have become abnormally methylated in, uh, in the cancer cells. So if you look at the top left, I don't have time to discuss on the right, you can see a CPG island which is repressed and inaccessible. That was actually shown clearly on the slide. When we remove the methylation by genetic knockout, two things can happen. On the left-hand side, we get regions which become open, accessible, and the genes tend to become expressed and become active. But the majority of promoters in which we lose the DNA methylation actually remain uh, repressed by the activity now of the lysine 27 trimethylation in which there's been what we call an epigenetic switch from the DNA methylation suppression to a suppression by the histone mark, the polycomb repressive mark, um, which it keeps these genes silent and inaccessible. And the thing that I haven't had a chance to show you very clearly 
is, is that what something which we saw, which was totally unexpected, was the fact that there is nucleosome phasing um, which has occurred even in these repressed uh, regions. So something that hadn't been seen before was this uh, ability of, um, uh, of nucleosomes to be actually phased around regions which are actually not e um, even accessible and which are not being actively uh, transcribed. I want to briefly move on to a discussion of enhancers. Um, I have only a, another five or six minutes to talk to you. And I just want to briefly show you some exciting new information we have, which is actually in press at the moment, in which we have discovered something completely unexpected with respect to these um, enhancers, particularly super enhancers, which are large regions of, uh, uh, in which large uh, uh, numbers of enhancer units are actually coupled together. So this shows you again, and this slide using no seek, if you look at C3, which is cluster three, a whole set of regions which are inaccessible in the wild type cells, which become accessible in the double knockout cells. You can say there's a lot more green there. These regions are all in enhancers. And the DNA methylation is actually really important in this region as well. You can see that we go from yellow to blue, which is associated with a loss of methylation and an opening of the enhancer. Now I'm going to have to uh, rush through this data, and so I'm not going to show you the, the, um, the, the data itself, but just to go to the summary uh, in order to um, save some time uh, to show you that we have discovered in these enhancer regions regions of what we call bivalency, in which we are quite unexpectedly have observed um, the coexistence of a DNA methylation mark, which is considered, of course, a repressive mark, and a histone <coughs> 27, H3K27 acetylation, as depicted in green, which is an active mark. And we see that in enhancers, we have not any super enhancers, we actually have a new form of bivalency that's never been seen before, which is actually representative of super enhancers. It only occurs in these regions, and where the transcription factors bind, we lose, as shown by the octagon there, there is no DNA methylation, but we have large regions of chromatin in which we have both an active um, histone mark and a repressive DNA methylation mark coexisting with each other. And so this is very exciting, and this will uh, shortly uh, be published. So to summarize what I've said there, I think we have now, looking, going back to those electron microblocks, we're getting a much better idea of how DNA methylation, histone modifications, and nucleosomal positioning uh, act together. So as you've seen throughout my talk, the DNA methylation patterns are profoundly altered in cancer and therefore using drugs which can inhibit DNA methylation is, seems to be like a valid uh, treatment uh, modality. Now we know that patients respond to, um, uh, to 5 as cytokine treatment, for example, but we don't actually know why they respond. And so I want to discuss some new data which we've recently published, which suggests that they might respond for reasons which we would not have predicted. So in this slide, which is a cartoon, uh, you can see the sorts of things we've been thinking of up until now. So we, at the top of the slide, you see a cell with a CVG island, and during the course of aging and infection, for example, you can get aberrant DNA methylation in the promoter, as shown by the red dots. And then during the formation of cancer, of course, we can get the silencing of tumor suppressor genes, such as P16 or MLH1 which results in the cells behaving in an abnormal fashion. And the idea we've had all along was just that maybe what happens with the hypermethylating drugs was that we would remove this methylation and restore uh, normal activity to the cells. Now, when we do these initial experiments, we focus on tumor suppressor genes. But when uh, Daniel de Cavallo was in my lab, we decided to do a, just a, a look to see what actually happened without being targeted. And so what we did was to look at the expression of genes as a function of time after a 24-hour treatment 
of human colon cancer cells to the drug by the azacitabine. And at the top of the slide, you can see what happens. That after five days of treatment, there's a group of genes which is rapidly induced, including tumor antigens and various other genes, and that these genes subsequently get switched off again as the cells grow after treatment. But interestingly, at the bottom part of the slide, you'll see that there are, in fact, another group of genes who, which takes a bit longer to get turned on. And the question is, what are these genes? Well, very interesting, the genes that come on later are actually part of the antiviral defense pathway. Um, so this was very, very interesting. And of course, if we look at the top of the slide, we didn't see any viruses expressed. And the reason for that was very simple because we don't actually have viruses on the arrays that we were using. So the idea then came about that maybe what was actually happening with these drugs is that there were retroviruses which, constant, which are very prevalent in the human uh, genome, which are suppressed by DNA methylation. And that mainly what was happening here was is that DNA methylation inhibitors were turning on the expression of these genes, which resulted on the right-hand uh, right side of the slide in the induction of the interferon uh, uh, pathway as a result of the formation of double-stranded uh, RNA within the cytoplasm. So this is a completely different way of, of, of thinking about it. And so, um, very recently, uh, about six months ago, Daniel Tkavala and Steve Bailin, who came upon similar findings, actually showed in two back-to-back -back papers in Cell that this actually may be the way that uh, the drugs work, or maybe one of the ways in which they work. So if you look on the right-hand slide there, we have this idea of viral mimicry, that what the uh, drugs are actually doing is inducing the expression of these uh, retroviruses, and that this triggers the interferon pathway and cell death pathways uh, after the stimulation of um, genes which recognize double-stranded RNA uh, within the cytoplasm. So I just want to remind you that we focus all of our studies, not most of the vast majority of our studies on the 1.5% of DNA, which is involved in coding for proteins. But there's all this other material in the, in the human genome, including the LTR retrotransposons, which are actually also silenced by DNA methylation. And that may be the reason why patients respond to these kinds of drugs is not just because we turn on tumor suppressor genes, but also because we turn on the retroviruses and other repetitive DNAs. And this is going to be a very exciting area to look at uh, in the future. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a good day. After this fascinating talk from Professor Jones, I'd like to highlight the key characteristics of the placental epigenome, how it resembles to cancer epigenome, and how it can be altered in pathological conditions leading to pregnancy complications. In addition, as an example, I will also show uh, some related data from our laboratory, from a recent study. First of all, I would like to give you a brief summary on the main placental functions. So in many cultures, the placenta was recognized as a mystical organ. In Egypt, it was looked at as a second soul or secret helper and the Old Testament mentioned about it as the seat of the external soul. In other regions of the world, it was recognized as a helper or companion of the child to support healthy, strong, and wise life. As you will look at the slide on the right, as a good companion, the placenta executes three main functions which complement the functions of the highlighted fetal organs. While preventing the fetus from rejection, it also protects against infections and other environmental factors. It exchanges gases, nutrients, and waste products, and produces metabolites, hormones, and growth factors. So it regulates fetal development and maternal adaptation to pregnancy. However, failure of these functions leads to the termination of pregnancy or severe obstetrical syndromes. In turn, these adverse outcomes predispose to fetal maladaptation, also termed as fetal programming, and consequent adult onset diseases 
such as diabetes or coronary heart disease. We can look at the placenta as a diary of intravenous life and uh, its histopathological and molecular biological examination can help us understanding fetal injuries and maladaptations. So how the epigenetic regulation supports these placental functions and how is this regulation may lead to pregnancy complications? The complex functions of the placenta are supported by its complex structure and regulation. While the metabolic, endocrine, and immune functions are mainly performed by the virus, placenta, and trophoblast, invasion is a feature of the exogenous trophoblast. In many functional aspects, the placenta remembers to solid tumors. However, while placenta functions are tightly regulated specially and temporarily, this is not the case in tumors. Among the unique features of the placental epigenome which supports these functions, first I have to mention the epigenetic reprogramming which occurs during the pre-implantation period. Uh, as you see on the left side of the figure, after fertilization immediately the paternal genome undergoes active demethylation, while the maternal genome demethylated by a passive mechanism. Both genomes are remethylated around the time of the implantation, and it's uh, in a higher extent in the embryo and remarkably lower extent in the placenta. All these unimprinted genes and repeat sequences escape this reprogramming, keeping their methylation status like as in the germ cells. The low global methylation of the placenta is a unique feature. Uh, which is resulting on the previous process I've shown. And this is very similar to, as can be found in tumors when compared to somatic tissues. Recent studies showed large hypomethylated domains covering a large portion of the placental genome, similarly to as in tumors. These domains are consistently located within regions of low CPG and gene density. Genes located within these domains have open tissue specific expression. Interestingly, intra and intergenic regions in these domains have lower methylation, while promoters have higher methylation. Uh, in the slides, you can see that the low global methylation of placenta allows genome integrated retroviruses and retrotransposons to be expressed in the embryonic, early embryonic period. A recent study found a marked increase in the expression of various repeat elements in parallel with their demethylation in the developing embryo, as shown for the sign elements in the figure. Since these repeats often harbor cryptic promoters and enhancers, their demethylation permits the placenta specific expression of various genes involved in important placental functions, as listed in the bottom of the figure. Another unique feature is the intermediate placental methylation of tumor suppressor gene promoters, which are often completely methylated in cancer genomes. This difference may reflect the tight regulation of invasive properties of the placenta compared to the tumors. In addition, promoters of other genes associated with the invasion are also often regulated by methylation in the placenta. A class of genes that is dependent on strict epigenetic regulation in the placenta is subject to genomic imprinting, the parent of origin dependent monolithic gene expression. Placental imprinted genes regulate maternal resource allocation and influence fetal growth as well as prenatal metabolisms of the developing organs. Imprinting is sensitive to toxic environmental stimuli and this disturbance leads to various neurodevelopmental and fetal growth disorders. Imprinted genes tend to be clustered into chromosomal domains which are regulated by common imprinting control regions, as can be seen on the figure as well. This is also the case for the chromosome 19 microRNA cluster, 
the largest microRNA cluster in humans. It has emerging primates, and it members predominantly or uniquely expressed in the placenta, and many of them are expressed in some tumors. Chromosome 19 cluster microRNAs are the most abundant microRNA species in the trophoblast and trophoblastic exosomes, probably conferring maternal fetal signaling to modulate maternal adaptation to pregnancy. Their functions in tumors are also under intense investigations, as you can see on the right side of the figure. So, uh, the placental epigenome is very important in uh, regulating the function of the placenta and the development of the embryo. And there are several factors that are known to influence placental epigenome, like fetal gender, different environmental effects and factors, and assisted reproductive technologies, as shown in the top of the figure. Disruption or modification of the placental epigenome by these factors can lead to other gene expression, placental development, and functions. If maternal and fetal adaptation to placental dysfunctions are maladaptive, fetal development and growth trajectories can be disrupted, and obstetrical syndromes can develop, predisposing the fetus also to adult onset diseases. Maternal maladaptations may lead to severe acute and later onset death and health complications. So therefore, the studies of the placental epigenome have major importance of our understanding of diseases in pregnancy. However, several challenges need to be taken into account, especially the heterogeneity in placental epigenome regarding placental regions, cell types, gender, and gestational age. Also, large studies on well characterized cohorts are necessitated and aim for strengthening causal inference and functional relevance of the findings. As you can see, the NIH roadmap epigenomics project has already started to tackle these issues regarding both the placenta, but you can see on the figure that still there is a long road to go. Now I will give some insights into the placental epigenetic changes in a very severe complication of pregnancy called preeclampsia, and I also supplement with some data from our recent collaborative study. Preeclampsia is an obstetrical syndrome which affects 5 to 8 percent of pregnancies and causes about 76,000 maternal and half million parental deaths in a year worldwide. It is characterized by hypertension and proteinuria and it can lead to multi-organ failure as well. This multi-organ failure most severely affects the brain, kidney, liver, and circulation, the cardiovascular system of the mother. The fetus is mainly affected by the detrimental effects of prematurity, low birth rate, and fetal growth retardation, and often may have severe brain and lung injuries. The long-term consequences of these injuries and maladaptations include metabolic and cardiovascular diseases later in life for both the mother and her fetus. It is now well appreciated that the placenta has a central role in the development of preeclampsia, also supported by the fact that the only specific therapy of preeclampsia so far is the delivery of fetus and the placenta. Preeclampsia has very many etiologies, which trigger the initiation of a complex and multi-stage pathophysiology. In the first stage, injury of the extravillous trophoblast lead to the failure of the transformation of the maternal uterine arteries and the uneven blood supply to the placenta with consequent new trophoblastic stress. This stress then initiates the placental release of various toxic substances like um, pro-inflammatory cytokines and synthesis microparticles, as well as anti angiogenic proteins, as you can see on the figure. And this will lead to the anti angiogenic and pro-inflammatory states in the mother, which will result in the multi-organ injury and clinical symptoms. 
Various evidences show that pregnancy has two major subtypes. Lipos said this is, has mainly modest consequences on the fetus and also the mother, while early onset disease may have very severe impact on both. Placental disease is more pronounced in the early onset form, as you can see on the figure, while late onset pregnancy is predominantly uh, caused by maternal underlying diseases. In parallel with the more pronounced placental histopathologic and gene expression disturbances in early onset pregnancy, placental epigenetic changes are also more intense in this subform, as uh, provided evidence by various methods also depicted on the figure. Uh, these changes include a higher global methylation and a higher expression of DNNT1 in the placenta, and conversely, hypermethylation of promoters and harnessers and low CPG density regions in the placenta hegemon. It is important that the epigenetic changes are observed for genes involved in key placental functions, uh, namely in invasion and development. So now I would like to share some data with you from our multidisciplinary collaboration on placenta pathways of preeclampsia. We started in a way uh, that we use placenta transcriptomics and then arrived at the targeted epigenetic analysis of disease associated genes. Uh, we use the microarray data and run a rating gene co-expression network analysis on it and found that differentially expressed placental genes uh, uh, were in four major gene modules which had uh, unrelated expression. The separate expression of these uh, uh, modules were also uh, validated in a large number of cases with qPCR. And um, the most important findings was that two modules uh, out of these four, namely the so-called red and the green modules, uh, were completely separately uh, regulated in the placenta, and genes in one of them, the red module, were very uh, strongly correlated with blood pressure, thus maternal uh, problems, and uh, while the gene expression in the green module was separately associated with birth weight and, and also uh, fetal problems. When looking at potential hub factors within these modules, regulating their separate expression, we noticed that one of the transcription factors in the green module uh, with the most correlated expression with other genes was completely unknown regarding its expression, regulation, or functions. Therefore, we selected this for a comprehensive analysis. This transcription factor was found to be predominantly expressed in the placenta among 48 tissues, and both in villus and extravillus tropoblast in first and third trimester placentas. As you can see on the bottom of the figure, in preeclampsia, its expression was strongly reduced in invasive exovius trophoblasts compared to control tissues. So we knocked down this gene in an exovius trophoblast cell line and I looked at microarray and observed the dysregulation of many genes involved in growth, adhesion, and migration, important for trophoblast invasion. We confirmed these findings with qPCR and also with ELISA and confirmed two major placental invasion inhibitor molecules at the RNA and protein levels. Next, we also confirmed that there was a strongly reduced invasive and migratory capacity of the cells with the knockdown, suggesting that this gene, this transcription factor, has key regulatory roles in trophoblast invasion. When looking at the promoter of this gene, for repeat elements, we found many transcription factor binding sites for HIF1 alpha and ZED. These transcription factors are critically involved in two part epithelial mesenchymal transition and invasion. Of interest, due to the rapid promoter evolution in this gene, species with deeper trophoblast invasion have more binding sites for these transcription factors than others with less invasive placenta as you can see uh, in the top. The Lucifer as assays, they proved that the human promoter of this gene, which harbors the most binding sites, were more active upon ZED overexpression and hypoxia 
than promoters of species orang and macaque with less pronounced throat invasion. Next, uh, we looked at the UCSD uh, epigenome data and uh, we found that the promoter of this gene is hypermethylated at embryonic cells compared to somatic cells on the two repeat elements which contains the numerous fifth one alpha binding sites. This was quite pretty interesting and uh, especially because DNA methylation hinders HIF-1 alpha binding and especially because we also detected the DNA methylation dependent regulation of this gene in the trophorous like cells because upon other treatment uh, the expression of the gene was significantly increased. So uh, based on this data we hypothesized that hypermethylation of HIF-1 alpha signs in the suspected differentially methylated region may be key in disrupting this trophoblast invasion pathway in preeclampsia. The task uh, we faced was not trivial. Since no assays were available for the study of the methylation of the DNA on repeat elements. However, scientists at Zymer Research offered a unique possibility for us to look at this region at the nucleotide level. First, bisulfate sequence genomic DNA from primary cyto and syncytotrophoblast and Buffy code samples from the same frequencies and observe the differential hypermethylation of the two repeat elements in the trophoblasts. Then we laser capture trophoblasts from the 100 plus samples that we used for the previous uh, PCR validation study and isolated genomic DNA. Of importance, the DNA from patients with early onset pregnancy had significant hypermethylation of four CPGs located at the two HIF-1 alpha binding sites on one of the studied repeat elements compared to controls. Importantly, one of these CPGs, we observed a negative correlation between methylation and gene expression, a positive correlation between methylation and placental histopathological score, a negative correlation between methylation and birth weight. These results collectively suggest that the observed disruption of hypermethylation and hip one alpha binding sites in the promoter of a key invasion regulatory gene directly affects its expression as well as placental and fetal development. Final part of my story, uh, in, an important question I would like to talk about whether the placental epigenetic marks observed in our study and in other studies I mentioned and future works uh, in various pregnancy complications can be used for prenatal diagnostic purposes in the future. In 1997, Lowe and colleagues had their seminal observation on the presence of selfie fetal DNA in the maternal circulation, which can account for about 10% of total selfie DNA in the maternal plasma. And in 2011, we arrived to the clinical implementation of non-invasive genetic testing of cells-free fetal DNA. As you can see on the figure, it is already 14 years since the discovery of fetal methylation markers in maternal blood, and the whole fetal methylome in maternal plasma was sequenced recently as well. The question where future directions lead us in this rapidly emerging field. Current approaches target to look at the ratio of universal fetal DNA methylation marks and chromosome-specific fetal DNA methylation marks for analog screening. It is envisioned that trophoblastic DNA methylation marks that will be discovered for obstetrical syndromes in combination with universal fetal DNA marks will enable the screening of these syndromes in early pregnancy. And my final slide is a summary of the talk. So in summary, the placental epigenome resembles to cancer epigenomes. The pseudo-malignant placental epigenome is temporarily and spatially tightly controlled. It is sensitive to exposures to environmental factors, which may induce deviations in placental and fetal developmental trajectories. This may result in fetal loss, obstetrical syndromes, and adult onset diseases. 
The use of tropical specific epigenetic markers may become useful tools for the early non-invasive detection of pregnancy complications. I would like to thank you for um, your attention and also the contribution of my colleagues and collaborators involved in this study and the funding agencies uh, for providing support for our studies as well. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Tan. And now we will briefly turn it over to our sponsor, Zymo Research. Dr. Keith Boer, Manager of Epigenetics at Zymo Research, would like to share a few items. All right, thank you, Judy. Thank you to Peter and Gabor, and especially thank you to the, all the attendees listening in today. So my name is Keith, and I am the Epigenetics Service Project Manager here at Zymo Research. For those of you listening and watching who may not be that familiar with Zymo Research, I would like to take this opportunity to share a quick message about who we are and what we do. So for nearly 25 years, Zymo has been proudly serving the scientific community by providing innovative, reliable, and high quality research tools that are both simple to use and reliable in their performance. Zymo's first commercial product, the EZ Yeast Transformation Kit, launched in 1994 and facilitated utilization of the Yeast 2 hybrid technique popular at the time. Two years later, we launched the first wave of our DNA purification products featuring our unique micro elution spin column technology. In 2001, Zamo demonstrated an early commitment to the growing field of epigenetics research by launching the first of our patented line of bisulfite chemistry conversion kits to streamline the process of DNA methylation detection. Our bisulfite chemistries are now the most frequently cited and highest rated in the scientific literature. As our line of epigenetics products grew in popularity, Zamo Research became known as the epigenetics company in 2008. That same year, Zamo opened up its European headquarters in Freiburg, Germany. More recently, Zymo has launched a comprehensive suite of epigenetic services that makes genome-wide epigenetic analysis available to all, all researchers. Our next-gen epigenetic se sequencing services feature state-of-the-art sample prep technologies, workflows, and cutting-edge bioinformatics for the analysis of whole genome bisulfite sequencing, genome-wide uh, bisulfite sequencing, as well as targeted DNA methylation analysis. We also offer services for genome-wide DNA hydroxymethylation detection and ChIP-seq for the study of DNA and their protein uh, binding partners. Also gene expression in the form of RNA-seq to investigate small and regulatory RNAs as well as coding RNAs, mass spectrometry for the very precise quantification of epigenetic modifications, and of course, data analysis. To date, Zamo's services services have analyzed data from billions of sequence reads generated across hundreds of projects involving thousands of samples from academic, government, nonprofit, and commercial entities alike. And data generated through Zymo services have been cited in numerous academic journals and in work such as what was presented during this webinar today. In total, Zymo Research offers a unique set of products and service solutions for microbial and microbiomics research to sample collection and DNA and RNA purification, and of course, kits and services to facilitate epigenetic studies. To learn more, I invite interested parties to visit our website at www.zymoresearch.com or to email us at either services at zymoresearch.com or info at zymoresearch.com. Thanks again for your attention. Thank you all for your informative presentation. So a quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box down by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Jones and Dr. Tan will answer as many questions as time permits. And the first one is a two-parter. At what point is using the altered color of chromatin useful in detecting the presence of cancer? And so at what point of the cancer's growth can we detect the color change? and I'm not a pathologist. Um, so, so let me say that again. The color change is associated with chromatin changes and can be observed by uh, pathologists. I don't think anybody knows exactly yet when in the cancer process the chromatin becomes deranged to the point that someone can actually see it under the light microscope. 
But what I can tell you is, is that changes in DNA methylation are very common in human cancer and can often be detected in uh, tissues uh, before the emergence of a cancer. So it's likely that these changes occur at the molecular level uh, much earlier than they can be seen uh, through the microscope by a pathologist. Okay, next. Are energy dependent microRNA flanking sequences the most le likely link from DNA methylation to RNA mediated substitutions and epigenetically affected cell type differentiation? So the, so the answer is, 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 is rather complicated. I don't know exactly what you mean by energy dependent microRNA flanking sequences. Um, microRNAs or you know, small RNA sequences uh, which can be controlled by DNA methylation and changes in microRNA expression of course is, are associated with uh, cancer phenotypes and can be actually uh, reversed by DNA methylation inhibitors. However, the, um, the relationship between microRNAs and energy is, I think, a little bit unclear. And I'm not certain that I can answer the question in any more detail on that. Okay, Dr. Jones, this next question was posed specifically for you. In genetic disorders, do you expect defects in epigenetic signatures in the epigenome? Yeah, so this is a very, very interesting uh, uh, question. So, you know, we know of these uh, mutations, which I talked about, which occur in epigenetic modifiers. Uh, we know they're associated with cancer. We know that they can occur, um, uh, you know, they, they occur very early in the carcinogenic process. Some of them occur later. But actually, we're still very ignorant of, of how the mutations actually are translated, so to speak, in a change in the epigenome. So um, the, the jury's still out of exactly how this works. I think the main thing is that there are many more mutations in epigenetic modifiers than were anticipated, that clearly these can occur in a very early stage in carcinogenesis, but exactly how those changes alter the epigenome is not yet known. Um, but I can tell you, there are certainly a lot of people working on that. And so I would expect us to be able to tell over the next few um, years or so much more about how these changes uh, actually are meaningful in making a normal cell into a cancer cell. This next one is also for Dr. Jones. Can you discuss whether DNA methylation and histone modification is always related? Yeah, so, the, so we're beginning to get a fairly good idea now of the relationship between uh, DNA methylation and uh, histone modification. So clearly um, active genes, for example, tend to be marked by low DNA methylation at the promoter or the transcription star site and high levels of histone uh, modifications which are associated with active gene expression, such as acetylation of the lysine residues on the, on the histone molecules. So in general, there's a very good sort of correlation between DNA methylation and active histone marks on those genes which are active, and the other way around on the genes when they are silenced. So what, what was interesting about what I uh, talked to you about was this uh, bivalency which we see in the super enhancers, which is very much unexpected in which we see both a, a, a negative mark, so to speak, that is histone, uh, excuse me, DNA methylation coexisting with an active histone mark. And so this was unexpected and it might have something to do with the function of super enhancers during development in cancer. But yes, we know quite a great deal about it. We know how, uh, to, some, to quite a large extent, how these two uh, systems communicate with each other. Okay, next one is for Dr. Tan. On what basis was the control for the preeclampsia studies chosen? Thank you for the question. The controls are completely gestational age matched cases. So for term preeclampsia cases, we use term controls. 
for preterm preeclampsia or early onset preeclampsia is used um, use preterm controllers. Um, it is well known that the placental epigenome is changing and DNA methylation uh, in the placental genome is, is changing with gestational age. So it's a very important factor, um, especially in this um, study that we needed to take into account. So this was a fully, completely gestational age matched case control study. Thank you. We will post the next one to, uh, to Dr. Jones. Okay. This person would like to know if we could design the hypomethylating drugs depending on the structure and sequence of the neighboring sequences of the methylated ones in cancer cells so that the hypomethylation does not occur at random sites in the genome. Um, well, look, this, this is a very interesting question. And so uh, the, um, the fact is, is that the DNA methylation drugs that we have at the moment actually are pan inhibitors. They inhibit DNA methylation across the uh, across the genome. They inhibit methylation everywhere. And so they really, you might think, well, okay, that means they're non-specific. Well, they actually are non-specific in terms of demethylating DNA. But what is actually very interesting is when you remove the drug and the cell begins to remethylate the DNA, there's actually quite a lot of specificity at that stage. So they're not, uh, so, so the net effect is, is that different regions of the genome respond to demethylation differently. And um, I can't think of a way at the moment that we could design a drug which we could use in a clinic, for example, which would inhibit methylation in specific areas. But, you know, we're beginning to think that maybe this is a great advantage for these drugs because they are really um, genomic medicines. In other words, they, because they do so much, it might be uh, advantageous because cells um, might actually um, uh, open up new pathways for different uh, uh, in different cells, which in fact would be beneficial to the patient. So this is sort of going in the opposite direction to what you might call precision medicine, where you try and knock just one uh, particular uh, pathway at a time. But maybe turning on tumor suppressor genes, turning on microRNAs, turning on endogenous spectral viruses, et cetera, may have advantages in terms of, um, for example, making the cell uh, more uh, sensitive to drug therapies, uh, more sensitive to immunotherapy, uh, et cetera. But it's a very, very good question, but at the moment, nobody knows how to do this. Here's another one for you, um, Dr. Jones. How much energy does RNA have as compared to DNA before transcription occurs? Um, so, so I'm not sure if I understand this question because um, we don't normally think of RNA and DNA as having energy per se. I mean, they, we mostly think of them as being a, a storage of uh, information, a genetic code or the code um, that, um, that can be used to direct the formation of proteins, for example. But I don't think that uh, thinking about them as being stores of energy is really, um, uh, uh, really appropriate. So I think more of the time we think of them as being information storage rather than uh, energy sources. Okay, now, Dr. Tan, um, does the increase in birth weight relate to increased incidence of preeclampsia? It was a case control study and we didn't look at the incidence of preeclampsia. Anyways, we used a, a fetuses um, in our study, which um, who were um, appropriate for gestational age or small for gestational age, but we didn't have fetuses who were large for gestational age. So our study was uh, completely inappropriate to answer this question. This one is for Dr. Jones. How do you select a candidate gene effectively for DNA methylation research in certain cancers? So, so how, how you would uh, select a, a gene for DNA methylation research is really based upon uh, on your particular interest. For example, if you're interested in tumor suppressor genes, 
uh, you would tend to focus on genes such as uh, P16, P15, or um, MLH1, a DNA repair gene, which we know very frequently become abnormally methylated in the promoter uh, during the formation of a cancer. As I pointed out to you, however, it seems like we've been in our focus on genes, we've forgotten about the rest of the epigenome and the genome. So there are, for example, these retroviruses which are in fact um, suppressed by DNA methylation in normal cells and which we can turn on using these kind of therapies. Finally, I must say that you know, all of our focus up to now has been on, on the promoters of genes and we've sort of neglected and ignored the rest of the epigenome. And as if you heard from great, both my talk and um, uh, it, um, we've sort of ignored also the function of enhancers and, and, um, and uh, CTCF binding sites, uh, you know, as, as, as their potential role in cancer. So the pendulum is now switched. We're no longer now just focused on tumor suppressor gene um, at abnormal DNA methylation. We're trying to look at the rest of the uh, epigenome as well. And that's why I think it's going to be a very exciting time because we sort of were so focused on one thing that we sort of forgot about everything else. And some of these things like enhancer methylation may be very, very important uh, in the formation of a cancer. Thank you. I would like to once again thank Dr. Jones and Dr. Tan for their presentations. Do you have any final comments to share with us today, gentlemen? Yes, I, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank you for allowing me to participate in this uh, webinar. I think it's a very, very interesting and exciting time in the field of uh, epigenetics. Uh, particularly as it relates to the relationship between DNA methylation and the function of chromatin and the epigenome. And I think that this is not just a, you know, a basic science exercise, but very exciting and interesting that we now have a whole series of new drugs, um, most of which I didn't have time to talk about, which target these changes. And so I'm hoping that we'll see not only um, much more knowledge gained, but also much better responses uh, of, tumor, of, of, of cancer patients uh, to these kinds of therapies. So thank you very much. It was my privilege to be with you and, and present um, about placental epigenome. Uh, the studies on placental epigenome is, is an emerging field, a very interesting field, um, and uh, there are a lot to do, as you could see uh, in my figures. And uh, the importance of it is, is that uh, obstetrical syndromes are very frequent and the, the roots of the obstetrical syndromes uh, are lying in placental epigenomic changes very early in pregnancy. So if you can find those changes which are rooted in embryogenesis or even earlier, uh, then there is a hope to, to develop new uh, diagnostic tools in early pregnancy and hopefully uh, also some therapeutics as well, uh, knowing that this is very difficult because uh, we are talking about two patients, the, the mother and the baby. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it was a great time here, and I hope that uh, uh, these thoughts uh, I presented um, generated many questions and, and hopefully others can also join the field as well. Thank you. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. We would also like to thank our sponsor, Zymo Research, for underwriting today's webcast. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, click on the CE button located in the bottom left corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. This webcast can be viewed on demand through October 11, 2016. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.